Hello everybody and welcome back once again to the Biff Rugby League podcast. It's episode three. For those of us watching on YouTube, or for those of you watching on YouTube, as you can see, Robin can't be here tonight. Unfortunately, he's been so busy moving house, trying to get Wi-Fi in, trying to get phone cables in, and he just hasn't had time to set up his his uh, office and, and do stuff that obviously isn't as important as, as pleasing... Um, and pleasing his partner and setting up setting up things in the house that are much more important. So um, everyone wish him luck. He should be back next week. But Toby, you're here. I'm not by myself. You're still here. How, how's your week been? Uh, my week's been up and down. Um, but, uh, you know, at least uh, at least I've managed to get into the podcast. So, <laughs> you know, let's go. Yeah, it's been an absolutely stressful week. I've managed to get an extension on my uni work so I can get this podcast done and do it over the weekend ready for next week so my stress levels have come down a little bit we're recording on Wednesday night again so we're pushing for a Thursday release fingers crossed um, I can get that out in time it's all it's all me 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 over this side everything all the behind the scenes stuff is just nibbling away um, but we, we best start off with um, with our story of the round uh, usually it's something that Robin brings us but but this week we've, we've sort of had to We've pulled together as a team and we've looked at there's been quite a few little stories here and there like today Jonathan Ford left to lose and Featherstone have signed three massive players that arguably could be playing in Super League well two of that three of them could still do a job for a lower level Super League club so quite good for Fev but after the situation that happened in Tonga with the underwater um, eruption and the tsunami wiping out the majority of the country um, the Combined Nations All-Stars will show their support for Tonga this year as they face England again. Uh, last year they supported um, Mossy Masoi. This year they will support Tonga and they'll wear special jerseys once again. And I believe all profits from this game will go towards fun, uh, will go towards any any support in, in Tonga, which I, I think is an absolutely fantastic, fantastic cause. Yeah, I'd absolutely agree. Um, it was something where actually because the idea we we wanted more internationals for so long, and I think last year the idea of this combined nations all stars versus England game, which ended up being the actual game itself, ended up being kind of meaningless, a bit farcical. Mm. Um, I think it got lost in the shuffle of what it's actually supposed to represent and mean, um, or at least we didn't know it was supposed to represent and mean that. Whereas now I think they're making it uh, making a point to for it to be a charity. Um, you know, event effectively, and that's absolutely brilliant. Um, so I'm really, you know, um, it's it's as good as reason as any to raise money for for what happened, and um, I, yeah, I I'm happy that they've sort of carried on with that rather than say it wasn't the most popular. Let's scrap it. They've gone. At least we raised money, and at least we did a good thing. So let's keep doing that, um, which is more than you know anyone sort of has to do. So good, good for them. Yeah, hundred percent. We've seen a lot of terrible and frightening scenes since the volcanic explosion, and there's a few players that are awaiting news of their relatives that that live over there. There's a lot of rugby league clubs and supporters will want to show their solidarity uh, with the Tongan people because Tonga is such a force in rugby league, especially since the last World Cup, which now will be, uh, which is just over four years ago, and a lot of those players of Tongan descent have come over to play for the English clubs. French clubs there's loads of Tongan players play for New Zealand there's a few Tongan players that now play for like Tongan um, heritage players that will play in Aust- in Australia as well and the fact that we're going to do something for them is fantastic and I'd be very surprised if there's not something done over in the NRL for to raise money for the, the support for the, for the funds going towards Tonga as well and I think it's really, really good and fantastic news for the sport. And once again, much like the Rob Burrow and Kevin Sinfield story we spoke about in episode one, it just goes to show how much of a community and how much of a family our game is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's brilliant. I mean, you think of the scenes when Tonga would play home games in New Zealand and then they'd actually get mm. better crowds than New Zealand would get in New Zealand. And <laughs> You look at that, like, I think... For anyone who any rugby league fan who saw those scenes a couple of years ago, uh, well, well, four years ago I guess, but they've they've fallen in love with the sort of the Tongan people and the culture that Tonga bring to rugby league, and I think you know I think this 
this for me is something where I, I you know I'd find a way to support it if I, if I could um, so yeah uh, it, it's brilliant to see and um, it yeah I'm just really happy um, that we're sort of you know we're recognising the globality of the game um, and sort of contributing to that world community um, that Rugby League brings with it yeah definitely fingers crossed that the event runs smoothly and we can and as a sport we can raise plenty of plenty of funds for for Tonga and they can they can hit, they can recover quicker than they might not have been able to do without any any fundraising help but that's our story of the round this week massive kudos to the RFL and England Rugby League and the the players for for stepping up and doing this we know that it's going to be on the weekend of the 17th to the 19th of June we don't know what day we don't know what time I don't think we even know when it's where it's going to be played and we don't even know who's going to be coaching the All-Stars because Tim Sheens is now over in Australia with, with the West Tigers. So that's that's really, really good. We're going to move on, though, now. And it's my turn to pick someone to join the Hall of Fame. Last week, you picked your League One winning North Wales Crusaders side. And that 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 is your bit of rugby history. Um, Robin decided first week deserved to go to Rob Burrow and Kevin Simfield. Massive, massively, the fact that they were number one is huge. But for us, they definitely deserved it. This week, I'm going to choose someone who I fell in love with watching rugby league. That that I once met and got to sign a shirt, and I didn't realise how big he was until I stood next to him. As I think I was like a nine year old, um, and maybe I was probably even younger. I was probably um, between the ages of eight and ten, certainly. When, when I met this man and Bradford Bulls were playing down at, at Harlequins and my dad was what, what, the fourth official, I believe, on the day. Um, but Lesney Vinacolo is is my Hall of Fame inductee this week. The Volcano. He is now the age of 42. But between the years 2002 and 2007 for Bradford... The man scored 145 tries in 149 games and kicked a solitary goal. And he, he made me fall in love with Bradford. And like as a kid, I never really supported a team. I just followed players around. I would always support the team that Matt Cook played for because the family, like the family friend connection we have with him. And I loved the way Bradford played in the early noughties and I think most of us can agree and Vinicola was just one of those players like he made his debut in the World Club Challenge where they beat the Newcastle Knights scoring 13 tries in his first 24 appearances in a season that was hampered by injury like he was named in Bradford's team of the century that's that is ridiculous that is absolutely crazy I mean, according to, I'm reading a little bit now on Wikipedia, but according to Wikipedia, he's got 149 tries in 152 games, which is even better, which is probably counting Challenge Cup games and potentially friendlies as well. But for a man with that sort of record, he played less than 15 times for New Zealand. But he did score 14 tries in those 12 appearances. I don't, you probably won't remember. I don't know. I think you were mentioning off screen. You didn't really remember him playing in in rugby league. You, you sort of sort of remember him being a rugby union player at the time. But you have to admit he is arguably one of Super League's greatest, if not Super League's greatest ever winger. He's one of the names that, if you watch any sort of rugby league content, at some point someone will either get compared to Vinicolo or someone will mm. reminisce on. Vinicolo, the Alaska player, what was the hardest thing you ever had to do? And it was defend Vinicolo, or, you know. Um, and he, so he, he's a name that just has sort of become, you know, synonymous with the game in the same way of like a Martin O'Fire or something like that. Um, and yeah, I mean, you read that, you see the, like, the size of the bloke, and mm. you see his highlights, and you, and you see what he was able to do with Bradford. You know, he was part of the great Bradford Bulls, and, you know, that, that Bradford Bulls team is why. We all really want to see Bradford back in Super League one day, um, and yeah, he, he, I mean it was fantastic. But 
as they say, it was. I did get into rugby league a little bit late, <laughs> later on in my life, and I don't quite remember him like playing live. But of course, I've seen the many highlights that come up at Challenge Cup time of year or during Super League rewinds or <laughs> things like that. Yeah, but like I said, my inductee into the Rugby League Hall of Fame this week is is the Volcano, Lesney Vinokolo, and he didn't just absolutely smash it for for Bradford. He smashed it for Canberra as well in the between the years of nineteen ninety seven and two thousand and two. Your team, so we're both lucky enough to have a player of this caliber play for the team that at the time, for me anyway, I supported. But for you, and probably not a legend for Canberra, but certainly a player that. Is very very well respected, um, which links us really nicely onto onto your section and the section that you like to talk about this week. It's it's not the watch NRL NRL watch. <laughs> <laughs> that sponsorship will come. <laughs> but yeah, um, the the NRL watch uh, this week, and sort of we're still going sort of through preseason. Um, we're still sort of looking at what's to come in the NRL. And instead of looking at what's to come this season, we're going to look at what's to come in 2023. Uh, well, anyone who followed us uh, last year when we were under a slightly different name on Twitch, um, you know, you will have heard us talk about the Dolphins when they first sort of got announced as an NRL um, club. But now they've made some signings. Um, Wayne Bennett's using his uh, Queensland influence, um, and he's got Jesse Bromwich, Felice Kafusi, Jermaine Asako. Mark Nichols, Ray Stone, and Val- Valince Tawere, um, who's the least well known of those players, but to sign for the Dolphins for 2023. Now, it's not uncommon for us to see players sign, for, in the you know, for us to see players sign for, for you know, two seasons ahead, effectively. Brandon Smith did it, has just done it for the Sydney Roosters, for example, yeah, Josh yes. Hodgson, the Eels, um, etc. Um, but Signing a whole squad up before they've even played this season, and then hoping that they all have good seasons and can push straight into a completely new team with completely new teammates. Is it going to be successful? That's my question for you, Brad. For my, that question for me, I don't know. I think under Bennett, anyone can be successful. I think if it wasn't Wayne Bennett, I'd be. I'd have a totally different answer. The players so far they have signed are going to, are, are good players, and there are players that we know will come in potentially even from Super League, young players from Super League that are maybe not going to get the game time at established clubs. Players like Herbie Farmworth, who is at Brisbane and maybe not one of the best players in the NRL, is definitely going to go into Redcliffe and be the and be one of the top centres, and he's going to start every week because we know Wayne Bennett likes him. There's players that they have signed that people are like, ah, I can see why they'd want to go and play for Wayne Bennett. And I think Wayne Bennett is the person that they're going to play for. How long those players decide to last, it, it's so difficult to, to sort of, to say are they going to succeed. It, I'd like to see them not finish bottom of the table. Put it that way. I don't really know where else I can go for that. If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, obviously, with a Wayne Bennett coach, with Wayne Bennett as coach, um, I think he's probably the only coach you could have got who could convince players to join a completely unknown entity. Yeah. Um, I think there is a genuine worry that unless you love Wayne Bennett or you always or you've all got this like respect for Wayne Bennett, um, and why would you take this risk? And there's nothing. That particularly, apart from the fact that the Dolphins have a completely empty salary cap and can spend yeah. freely, there's still no reason why you would sign for the Dolphins over one of the other 16 NRL clubs. You know, someone like Brandon Smith, he's definitely gone. I've got a better chance at a proven NRL club out like the Roosters than one that is just completely new. And I think that's it. As you look at these players, they're signing props and second rows who, as long as they do their part, will still be playing Origin, still be playing internationally, you know, things like that. Are they going to be able to get a hooker's halfback? Um, I mean, they've got Osaka, who's a fullback, but I think he's sort of going to be a winger by the end of this season. Yeah, essentially. Uh, yeah, you know, are they going to be able to get a spine in free agency? Uh, is sort of the big question that I'd have on my lips. Um, 
I don't see as I say there's something about it being Wayne Bennett and there's something about the fact that Jesse Bromwich and Felice Cafuti are both willing to leave Craig Bellamy in the storm and win a place where they are pretty confident that they're going to get to a, they're going to be top four every year yeah to, and this, this is a team mean, they've selected and they've, they've signed Felice players now like there's got there's a whole year ahead the more quality players they sign the more quality players will want to move to the Dolphins I feel as well yeah, so that's 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 sort of where I was going. Was if these players are willing to move now, does that give confidence to players potentially coming off contract? But there's also the market to sign off contract players is insane, um, and as in players are getting snapped up now, um, and I genuinely just don't know how well the free agent market's going to be able to support the Dolphins to build a team that's to build a team that can win, and is that even the plan? Do they, do they want to win now? Do they want to do a Toronto? Or do they want to do a Cornwall? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's difficult, isn't it? It's Are they going to go out there and spend all the money straight away? Or are they going to, like you say, do a Cornwall and slowly but surely take players from the Redcliffe system and players that are from Brisbane and work their way up and slowly sign players? It It's it's, it's weird, isn't it? It's, it's not quite... We're not quite sure how, which way they're going to go about it, but you know for sure that they're going to play defensive rugby. They're not going to be necessarily a free-flowing rugby side. They're going to focus on de- on defence first, which is why potentially they've brought in the the defensive so- solidity that they have in terms of Felice Carfusi, Ray Stone, Jesse Bromwich. Yeah, they absolutely. Yeah, it could. As I say, I think it, there is many questions, but I think it's fascinating seeing a completely new team who have to sign everyone as free agent. There's no sort of like draft system or expansion system like yeah. you get in American sports. It is. You've got to just go out there, wave your wallet at people and hope that they come hope to that you. they sign. And because of the coach they've, they've, they've got in, they've actually managed to bring across names which was synonymous with winning premiership titles. Yeah, quite um, and quite a few. Yes, they've signed Osako who very nearly one a wooden spoon but the players when they come in and play with better players around them they're not going to be that type of player again are they yeah exactly so we'll see we'll absolutely see um sort of what's going to happen and i think it's just a conversation now where you, you know you imagine yourself i've done it many times on american sports games like put making myself as like the new coach of an, of an expansion team and seeing what i can and pretending that I'm, i know everything and like putting yourself in that mindset of like I, I i just don't know how it must be so hard to create a sort of winning business model when you have no idea how the rest of how players in general are going to respond to you um and i think it'll be a conversation this conversation will be even more relevant when if we get an 18th nrl team and wayne bennett isn't there to coach them like, yeah what's exactly gonna, what's gonna happen then um, because I think that pulling power of Wayne Bennett is huge in this situation. Yeah, a uh, quick question for you. Who, where is the 18th NRL team going to be? Uh, I think, for me, Perth is the one where it has, like, it always has to be. There is no NRL, there's no NRL presence on the west coast of Australia. Yeah. Whenever they take a game there, you know, they get, they get good crowds. I think I could argue for Adelaide. I could easily argue for Central Coast because Sydney clubs get fans. <laughs> And apart from that, I mean, I, you know, there's always that hope that the game grows big enough in New Zealand and there gets to be another Pacific slash New Zealand kind of team. But I think Perth is the one where it's actually, you know, there's not people in Perth can't just travel to watch an NRL team, um, or they have, you know, the furthest distance to travel to watch the that like what's effectively the national sport of Australia. But cricket match to say about that, but or, or Aussie rules football. Or Aussie rules football. Yeah, is the only the only sport in Australia with the word Australia in it. So it kind of yeah. had, it feel like feel like that should be the national sport, but I'm not really sure. I'm not sure what they call the national sport in Australia now because everything seems they seem to be so good at everything, don't they? So and it's a little bit heartbreaking, especially if you're a cricket fan like me. Uh, but, but fingers crossed, uh, the women will change that over the next the next few weeks. Um, but no, really really interesting at the Dolphins to see what Wayne Bennett can do. Which of the players that are yet to sign a contract for 2023 decide decide to go there. There's plenty of off-contract players that aren't playing anywhere, any like anywhere at all at the moment across around the world, whether that be in England or in the NRL or like or in Australia. There's players that we know have only got one-year contracts over here that should technically, I think, especially Fev and Lee and 
some of the lower end Super League clubs, a lot of these players I feel like should have maybe got one or two more league day, years left in in the NRL. Potentially, I don't know if that if that will happen. People like Joey Leilua could easily be playing for the Dolphins next year if he scores 40 tries for Featherstone, doesn't get sent off and isn't a liability. If he shows that he can mature a little bit, there's no reason why he can't then go back over. He's young enough and arguably he is good enough. So, yeah, he's done two years ago. Um, Caleb Aikens was a fantastic stand-in yeah. for, for Dylan Edwards at the Panthers. and I say fantastic, he wasn't producing the try scoring um, or the chance creation that Dylan Edwards created. But he didn't do anything wrong either. Um, and now he's playing at Lee. And it's that kind of... I think you're absolutely right in terms of there's a lot of players who they're out of their rookie deals. Are they good enough to start for us every single week of the season? No. Send them away. Um, mm. Let's get our new kid through the system. Um, and I think that... And this is... It kind of annoys me when they in Australia they have this whole the talent pool isn't big enough. And it's just... Uh, the reality is... is they're a franchised competition with yeah. no way of distributing the youth talent. Exactly, hundred um, percent. Fairly distributing the youth talent, um, but their talent absolutely is there. I, if if everything was sort of better distributed. Yeah, definitely. Um, speaking of youth talent, there's probably going to be quite a lot of young players on show this week. Whether you're looking at preseason friendlies or you're looking at the Challenge Cup or you're looking at the Championship and. That's something that is we I'm really, really looking forward to see. Um but we we need to talk about the challenge cut really quickly. Last week we did our championship preview a week before, just so we could get a bit of a bumper issue in this week. We've got the challenge cup second round and the championship opening fixtures to talk about. And I'm good but I'm gonna start with the challenge cup. Um your standout tie this my my, my standout tie, your standout tie this week, just 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 for us obviously Robin isn't going to be able to give us his standout tie this week, but I'm pretty sure it'd have been York Acorn versus West Warriors. He said we were all going to try and get up there to York, weren't we, to try and to try and watch Wests versus York Acorn, and unfortunately that's not quite come about. So we're all sort of trying to get to something of our own. Um, I'm fingers crossed Robin can still get himself to that game, and he's can't, and he's sort of got himself into a state where he can get out of the house and go and do stuff. So fingers crossed that. But your your standout tie for the from the Challenge Cup second round this weekend. Yeah, um, so now League One clubs are in, now there's semi pro clubs in. You've got to look out for any potential giant killings. Uh, I say giant, you know, sort of normal sized men. <laughs> um, but it's, um, so that's why my son at Tyree is London Scholars, London Chargers, in a bit of a London derby. I think we got excited for it when we were previewed round one. We did. We got last week. We're getting excited for it now. Um, yeah, the. I think for me this is the t- the game between um, a League One and an amateur side that there's the closest talent gap. Uh, I'm going to get shown up by Lee Miners Rangers, <laughs> players, aren't I? But you know, of the four options of uh, Oldham Lane, Doncaster Thornhill, Lee, uh, North Wales, and London Scotland and the Chargers, I think this is the closest there is in the talent gap. Uh, the conversations we've had, everyone's pretty pretty convinced that Chargers could pull it off. Um, We'll talk about our predictions later. Um, but this is for me, um, yeah. This is the game where I want I want that result to come through uh, because I've I've just got you know we've all got that good feeling about it that it could be a bit of an upset on the cards. And it's also interesting because we're saying this about a team who are in playing in the Conference South League, yeah, the Southern Conference it's League, yeah. All right in terms of how rugby league's invested in and worked in the country. They have no right to be as good as a League One team, yet they are, and I think that's brilliant for the game. It's brilliant for sort of what these clubs are doing in the south of England now, and how the Southern Conference League is actually promoting talent within the south of England. Um, and yeah, I, it's a really exciting because it could mean so much in terms of the dynamic of rugby league going forward if a, if a win like this was possible for London Chargers. Yeah, I totally agree with you. As someone who's seen London Chargers play and is aware of a number of the London Scholars players, there is a huge chance that the Chargers will beat the Scholars this weekend. And I am I'm not gonna say who I think will win in terms of who I'm predicting, but it wouldn't surprise me if Chargers won. Um there's a, a, a few players that start that scholars have signed this off season that realistically 
wouldn't play for charges, if in my opinion, just the ones that I've seen play when Bedford Tigers have played them and I've played against myself. And the fact that these guys are playing for scholars is not a knock on scholars. Don't get me wrong. I think it's more of the issue that London Broncos have now gone part time. And a lot of and some of these scholars lads have gone to Broncos. The, the scholars head coach is now Broncos head coach, and this is a this is a cultural reset for London scholars. This is a brand new head coach in Joe Mabu. It's a brand new squad. Players have loads of players have left. Some have re-signed, and like I said, some players. It was a shock when they got signed, and I I am going to use Shane Hurley as an example. It shocked me. I really hope that Shane shows out and he proves himself as a League One player because I, I class him as a friend. And I don't often say that about teams from Hemel because of the relationship, or players from Hemel because of the relationship between Bedford Tigers and Hemel Stags. But I class Shane as a friend and I'm, I'm hoping it goes well for him. But I can't help but be worried for London Scholars because they are not the same London Scholars that played two or three years ago and even that London Scholars will have struggled to, to do you know what I mean it, it's so difficult and this London Chargers team after seeing them play in round one they weren't amazing but it was their first game in a long time they've now had a few weeks to prepare for this and this is the game they will have been preparing for I, I genuinely and, and maybe some of these Chargers players went to the London Scholars open trial so they know exactly what these players are, who they're playing against as well it's it's going to be a fantastic game, and it's go, it's just going to show how good rugby league in the south is. And I really hope that those of you that can get there, get there. Tickets are available for around eight ten pound for general entry, eight pound for concessions, and you will be given a drinks voucher redeemed on the day. So the bar opens at two, kicks off at three thirty. Get yourself to the New River Stadium if you can. Like genuinely, get yourself to the New River Stadium if you can this weekend. It's it's going to be absolutely fantastic. One of these teams, the fact that one of these two teams will be in the third round is, is unreal for me. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the biggest. I think the thing I also would want to say, just it's not many chance we get to talk about London Scholars over the course <laughs> of these weeks. I think, and like the fact that they've managed to survive as a club this long and become such a, yeah. a just a regular part of League One when Oxford was crumbling and Gloucestershire were crumbling. Yeah. Uh, and they've managed to stay there despite... I don't think they've ever reached the playoffs of League One. No. Uh, maybe they did when it was Championship One. I know um, Crusaders beat them in the 2013 Northern Rail Bowl uh, final. Yeah. Like, <laughs> more about that. Um, but, yeah. Um, yeah, it's incredible the sort of the way they stick together as a club. But also I, I, the way they invest in the s- South community and then just bring players in knowing full well that if they play well, we'll happily let you go to to a better team but here's your chance to prove that you can play semi-pro and I think they do that in a very similar way to Coventry Bears did it um, and it's sort of, they are a key part of the community outside of the sort of M62 corridor um, so but yeah so big credit to London Scholars because I do think they do good work despite the fact that they'll be the brunt of quite a few jokes across the course of the season I think they'll be a, they'll probably be the brunt of quite a few jokes if they if they lose to London Chargers on, on Saturday as well and I hope they don't, but I also kind of hope that Chargers win. It, it's such a catch twenty two because I want to see teams from the Southern Conference League do well. Um, West Wake, I want West Warriors to go up there and beat York. I want Chargers to get through. The fact that we could potentially see two Southern Conference League teams in round three. Yes, there's only six teams in round. There's only six games happening in round three before the championship sides come in round four. But the fact that there could be a slim opportunity for some Southern Conference League sides to face championship sides would be unreal. Um, and the only reason that this is not my standout tie is because we have the army versus the navy like it's payday tomorrow i am or today as this podcast comes out it's my payday and at, before this podcast comes out i will have brought train tickets to Aldershot. like me and my partner we're going down to Aldershot to watch army versus navy rugby league in the challenge cup for the first time ever it's going to be rammed down there it's i know robin had this whole like he wanted to do a whole thing on the history of rugby league between the army and the navy but the fact that this is their first game ever in the challenge cup between these two sides 
you can't get bigger than that for these two teams, I don't think, can you? I, I wasn't aware it was the first game they've ever played to in the Challenge Cup. Yeah. Uh, that is, yeah, that is quite quite sensational. Um, we've spoke about the Army and Navy so much, but I think it's kind of, I don't want to repeat myself, um, but yeah, we, you know, the representative side, we, we love having them. It make, it's something unique to Rugby League in, in a way. It is. Um, in fact, the Challenge Cup in general is quite unique to Rugby League. I mean, I know football have a similar thing, but if you look at Rugby Union, they don't do this sort of competition and things like that. Um, you look at many sports where this kind of competition just doesn't happen. Um, no. And yet, it's so, yeah, it, it, it's obviously an exciting game. We're really grateful to have it. And uh, I can't wait for Brad to be texting the group chat at four o'clock. Uh, <laughs> Happening in the game. Yeah, if you can't if you can't get down to Aldershot, the game is being live streamed on the Sportsman, so they've managed to get the the rights for that. And if you can't watch it on the Sportsman, follow us on Twitter. I'll be tweeting. I'll be live tweeting the game as it goes out. Like I'll be updating the score as it changes. So make sure you follow it in one of those three ways. But this is the first time. I, I just can't the fact that this is the first time they've been drawn against each other in the Challenge Cup since the year, since the turn of the millennium, like which is when they first, since they both came into the team. So, yeah, ugh, unbelievable. I think it's absolutely unbelievable. I mean, the one thing I want to address is just you said that the third round is going to only have six games in it. Yeah, that, that is awful. Um, and we I don't, hope... and we don't know the the the, round, the, fir- the third round draw isn't until the first of January. So. We will know what the third round ties will be next week, but we do not know what they will be before these second round ties are played. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's sort of to be expected. I'm not too like in general, they sort of. But yeah. at the same time, it's just that only six games in the third round of a Challenge Cup is just it's abysmal. Uh, I'm not happy about <laughs> it, um, and I think, but I think it's something that you know we, we can speak about how we prefer. Um, you know the challenge cup to look and, and this isn't it but i also understand that covid played a part in this and, and yeah and things like that. but it's um yeah i hope that sort of this is just a temporary measure and that we can look forward to a sort of a more full challenge cup uh, yeah in do, the cup. do you feel like they i think it's also i say do you feel like they could have added one more round of community level sides to make it two rounds before you had before you entered before you had the league one sides enter say in round three but then round four would still only be six games before the championship side comes in do you think that would be fairer do you think that would be a would have been a better way to do it um i I think potentially yeah um i think there's i don't know i think super league need to enter um, I, I think Super League needs to enter at a round of 32 and I think they currently enter at like half round of, at yeah. round I think it's around yeah. only four enter at one point and then the rest enter at another point and it's or something. yeah but yeah, Super League needs to enter into a round of 32 um, and I think that then work that up however you want from, from there upwards but there is a severe like the Challenge Cup is designed to be won by a Super League team yeah um, and although they're probably going to win it anyway. Um, I think that it's not even very, like hard for a Super League team to win it. It's like two lucky yeah. draws, big semi final, and then you're in the final. Yeah, definitely. Um, you looked. You look at Halifax getting to the semi final back in 2019. It's the closest any non Super League side has ever come to making the final. Yeah. Like that just says. I, I think that says something about the way the competition is run. And I, I agree with you on the fact that you could you should put Super League clubs into the round of 30, that round of 32. And then work back. You work forward, so you figure out. Okay, you know that this is going to be the round of thirty-two. Then you've got your sixteen. Then you've got your quarters. So they have to play at least four games before they reach the final. Just trying to figure that out in my head. Then, so they, they're still playing four games until they reach the final. Now, I think they're only playing three games till they reach the final. So they're playing a game more, and you could still include more community level sides and representative sides in in yeah. earlier rounds. But I think does that. Is that now changed because the final is now being played in May rather than July? Because you're taking two months of the season away to fit in. You've then got to take two months of the season away, usually when you'd have probably fit in another round. Uh, you may have to, but also I think you know you can just sort of rejig the season and just play that Challenge Cup 
you know, sort of less than the Super League games, three, three Super League games, Challenge Cup, three Super League games, Challenge Cup, three Super League games, Challenge Cup, and then say we'll have a big chunk of Super League after the Challenge Cup, and you don't need to worry about it. And I quite like the Challenge Cup being moved to May anyway, to be fair. Um, gives, you know, I think it because it's weird when Challenge Cup comes and you're like two weeks of Super League and boom, playoff. Yeah. Um, looking, you, you, Challenge Cup winners have just gone on a three game losing run because <laughs> they, haven't, they haven't got out of the nightclubs yet. And yeah, it's. Um, so I quite like it, and I think there is ways to manage it. Um, but I think that any, especially if the if the system works properly uh, in terms of how the NCL and Southern Conference League, you know, manage the amateur, the quality of amateur players yeah. all in the, all of those teams should be in there at a minimum, I think. And yeah, or well, at least all the NCL. Well, the way the the way the the pyramid is, according to the pyramid, the Southern Conference League and the Nas- and the National Conference League Premier Division are tier four competitions. So every single one of those tier four clubs arguably should be in the Challenge Cup. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, yeah that, but also like the NCL as a whole competition with Division 1, 2 and 3, I would love to be able to to, to say could be open there. But again, that would come down to a lot of logistics. Because um, I think mm. the way it was always my impression back when, you know, a few years ago was that it was the whole NCL plus the winners of the Southern League, the North East League, the North yeah. West League, the exactly. university champion and then the representative sides were in there as well. Like selected individuals from the NCL. There was like one NCL two club, one yeah. four NCL junior clubs, and then like three Southern Conference clubs. Um, and yeah, so I think that's the thing. Though at a minimum, the whole of tier four needs to be in there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's fine. Well, like I said, that was my standout tie, and I can't wait to see that. Your standout ties, the, the London Derby. We'll quickly run through the rest of the games. We've already mentioned York Acorn versus West Warriors. That, I think that's going to be an absolute cracker. And I don't, it's not one of our predictions, but I, I, I think the West Warriors will, will sort of clean up house there. I think, I think they're just that little bit stronger. We've seen that, I've seen the highlights of when they played Jarrow, and oh my God, I think York Acorn are going to struggle. Um, we've got West Hull versus Rochdale Mayfield. Two amateur sides potentially then going into round three. You're going to be guaranteed at least one amateur. We're now guaranteed two amateur sides and a representative side. We've got Hunslet Club Parkside versus Stanningley, which I think is going to be one of the biggest games of the round. It's not quite big enough for me to be a standout, but two Premier Division sides that put in pretty decent performances last in round one. Um, this is going to be quite a big one, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I watched I watched parts of the Stanley game, and they they sort of uh, they won the war. Of, they won sort of on attrition at the you know against Bentley. Um, Bentley came out with the brighter ideas, but Stanley came out with a sort of better match fitness and mm. were able to sort of perform in the last sort of fifteen twenty minutes of the game. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see if you know which team blew off the most cobwebs from their their round one wins. Um, but again, any sort of game between two Premier League uh, NCL Premier sides gets me excited in the Challenge Cup. I think so. Yeah, speaking of that, we, I think it looks like we've got another one here as well. Pilkington Rex versus Siddle that also kicks off at, at half two on Saturday. You briefly mentioned Lee Miners Rangers earlier. Your your Crusaders are playing away to Lee Miners on on Saturday. Do you think that's going to be a tough game for you guys? Just really quickly. North Wales Crusaders went on a winning run last season where the squad's mostly the same but in a little bit more quality as well I don't think it should be a challenge um, however it's the first game of the season uh, they've had their friendly away at Barrow got cancelled so this is you know there isn't the team one. haven't actually played yeah. any rugby together uh, in 2022 uh, so I think that there is a risk and you know I think Lee Miners Rangers will really be up for this because the amateur sides do treat a League One club, as you know, as showing that they should, these players treat it as an audition almost, I guess, um, in in some respects, and they really do get up for these games in the same way that a Championship club would get up for playing a Super League club. In wait, Halifax got up to play in St Helens as you mentioned before. So. Yeah, and ran and ran them pretty damn close for the first hour or so as well. So I think there's absolutely a chance they get turned over, but I would say that North Wales Crusaders are actually a quality league one side again at this point based on what we saw last season um so at the end of last season um so i would be back in crusaders uh, i'd probably say it's about about an 80 20 chance <laughs> uh, then we've got our first all league one tie it's being shown on the bbc 
and it's the first ever game for Midlands Hurricanes under their under their new name. They're away at Rochdale Hornets. That's I think that's going to be a cracking game, and I think it, the fact it's on a Sunday it means that we we can all sit down. You, me, and Robin. Hopefully, he's all settled. The, the three of us can sit down and we can watch this game, followed by Oldham versus Lock Lane on our league. We can sit down, watch these, and go bloody hell. These these are going to be some cracking games, aren't they? These two these two televised games. I don't know. I honestly don't know what to make of the Midlands Hurricanes. You know, I, 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 I've st- I'm a bit sad because the Cold Bears logo is a much better one. <laughs> yeah. you know, we'll Cold get Bear into logos badge. in a bit. Don't you worry, mate. The Cold Bears badge is much better than the <laughs> Like in the purple, um, it'll be interesting to see Midlands first ever game. Um, it's a shame it's not at home. We don't get to see what um, the Birmingham and Sully Hole ground looks like, with it, whatever it's called, Portway. Yeah, I believe Portway Rugby um, Football Club, I believe, they're playing at. Um, but, you know, we'll sort of, I think it's, they are a bit of a open book. Um, we'll see what happens. It'll be, I think, I think Rochdale, you know, are a very, very, are probably one of the stronger sides in a, uh, yeah. Um, so, it's, it's, it could be a bloodbath, but um, it's exciting, you know, it's, it's exciting to see if the Midland Hurricanes can be successful, this could be a great place for them to start. Yeah, finger, so. fingers crossed for, for Alan Robinson and all that he's doing there. The next televised game is kicks off at 6pm on Sunday. It's Cast Lock Lane versus, or Lock Lane, I should say, versus Oldham. I'm surprised this was televised over London Scholars, London Chargers, aren't you? Um, a little bit. Um, I think, I think there's an element of, Let's get the teams people know on TV. Potentially, uh, yeah, Billy. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I think there's an element of that. Uh, I'm really grateful that they've chosen. I think it's also probably easier to set up a camera in a League One ground as opposed to an amateur. But... It's, it's being played at London Scholars though, so they're both yeah. being played at, new, at League One grounds. That is true. So I don't really know, but I'm really grateful to our league. Um, for yeah, hundred percent. Yeah in a game that's not just two uh league you know two league one sides um i i honestly um i think i, I think that it's a northern thing probably get some more viewers um things like you know it's probably i mean the rfl offices are in manchester they've probably got all the equipment in yeah it's the, probably quite close isn't it so yeah so i think there's probably some logistical factors taking part <laughs> um but and six o'clock on a Sunday is a weird, weird time. Um, yeah, I think not, it, it not... gives. I think it gives everyone the chance from the three o'clock fixtures to get themselves home, except from the except from maybe Swinton back from West Wales. <laughs> uh, I think everyone yeah. else will be home and chilled, and then they can watch that game on our league. So maybe that's that's just to make sure everyone's watching it. Yeah, but I'm still excited for it. You know, I'm I'm excited to see. I'm, I'm always excited at the potential of a. Of you know an amateur side winning uh, in against a semi pro side, so it should be exciting. I think that excitement carries across both the scholars, Chargers, and the Oldham Lock Lane game. So you know, or, or Doncaster Thornhill, I guess too. So it's uh, yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, um, we've got three. Like I said, Swinton are going to be playing at West Wales. Keith the Cougars will travel to Hunslet, and then the final community level side will be Thornhill Trojans travelling to. Doncaster, uh, that wraps up our, our sort of Challenge Cup look this week. But now we have to move on to the Championship. It's the opening round of the Championship. We did our preview last week. We predicted our league table. If you haven't already seen that, there, sh- there will be um, a graphic thrown up, ready to go f- um, before the end, by the time this comes out tomorrow. I'll make a league table graphic. I'll throw that on Twitter for you. If it's not out, tweet us, tell us it's not out. And I'll, and I'll put one together and make sure that it's out. But we have our opening round of, of challenge, blah, 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 Betfred Championship fixtures. Um, first up, we have Newcastle versus Workington. Uh, sorry, Workington versus Newcastle. Lee Centurions versus Whitehaven. Barrow versus Sheffield. Batley versus Halifax. Dewsbury versus Bradford. London versus Widnes. And then our first Monday night game on Premier Sports, York City Knights versus Featherstone Rovers. Um, we start off with the first game really quickly. We'll just quickly sort of run through them, nothing too in depth, because we don't know what the team we don't we haven't had the squads out yet, so we're not really sure what what these teams are going to be looking like. But Workington will welcome Newcastle Thunder to Derwent Park. 
Yeah, this is well. I was I pushed when we planned our predictions and when we agreed our predictions together. I planned. I was the one who pushed for Newcastle uh, to be a playoff side. <laughs> so this is you know this is a big you know this big moment for me to see if Newcastle are this good. Um, I think they've signed some brilliant players, um, and I think unless Workington is sort of a very muddy, boggy, January <laughs> cold pitch, which the Cumbrians love and grew up on. I think there's a chance. I think I think they don't stand too much of a chance against Newcastle in this game. Yeah, no, I don't either. And I think Whitehaven don't particularly stand much of a chance against this Lee side. I don't know how strong this Lee side will be at the start of the year. They don't usually start off fantastically well. They didn't start off very well at all last year, which ultimately led to their relegation. And like Robin mentioned last week, they're trying to find form. But like they've got they've got a really new squad and they're trying to find form. Have they played enough together to beat a Whitehaven team that we have finishing in the playoffs again this season? Oh, I mean, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, in terms of the individual players, if Lee put out a full squad, which I don't, some of their players are still, I think, they've only just arrived in the UK anyway. Yeah, I believe so. If they put out a full squad, then I, you know I'd really, I'd really like Lee one to seventeen when they're fully fit. Um, but you know, as you say, start of the season, you never know what's going to happen. Um, we've got nothing really to go off. I don't think we can look at Lee's, Lee last season to sort of indicate what they could do this season. Um, and but we can with Whitehaven. Um, and if Lee are going to end up going through. A sort of meltdown uh, as a club, you know, um, which uh, you know, and start spiraling, um, like I think some people are suggesting um, that things just aren't going right for Lee. Um, then this this is a potential upset, but I, I I would assume that the Lee squad will be strong enough to to win this game. But yeah, yeah, I think I have to agree with you on that one. Next up, League One champions Barrow Raiders kick off their championship campaign campaign at home against the Sheffield Eagles. Do you think Barrow could could nab a few wins and finish, and potentially against the likes of Sheffield and those teams finishing low, or do you think they'll be struggling to get wins this season? Yeah, start of the season, um, and the way Barrow played when they were at their best last season, um, I think that this is this you know first you know this is their chance to really go out and be like we're here to we're here to play. We are a talented side on on our best day. I don't. I think across the whole season we'll see him drop off. But with the Sheffield team, who have made a couple of improvements, but you know, are probably still on a, you know, not on too much of a high from last season. I think that this is Barrow. Barrow could come out of the blocks really strong, um, especially, you know, as you start to look at, you know, they've got a Cumbrian derby next week, uh, and then they play Newcastle. There's no games there against the sort of the sides that we put right up in the top 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 of the table and they could come out of the blocks quite strong yeah talking of coming out of the blocks quite strong Halifax have to do it don't they this season they have to they can't afford to maybe lose three out of their first four games like they did last year and then go on a run they have to hit home they have to go out there and put Batley to the sword and at the Foxes Biscuit Stadium don't they this weekend yeah I think this game will, I think this could be an incredibly close game um, you know both sides were at the top end of the table last um, last season um, I mean, I really like what Halifax have done with their squad. I really like the money they've spent, um, and you know, I think if they're as good as we've picked them up to be, then this is a game which I think it's a must-win because I can tell you for a fact that whoever ends up uh, sort of at the top of the table isn't going to have dropped points against Batley. Um, no, certainly Batley, not. But they're a good side, and there's only three or four teams higher than them who are going to who are going to finish higher than them, probably. Yeah, um, we have but, them finishing quite high in our table, and I think I think maybe even fourth or fifth. We have them finishing fifth, I believe. And you you don't want the teams above the only teams that Batley are going to lose to are the teams above them in the table. I think this season. Yeah. So next up, we've got Bradford Bulls playing away at Dewsbury Rams, the Tetley Stadium. Bradford played in Dewsbury for a bit. This isn't like this is like. They know what this ground's like. They know what this pitch is like. Yeah. They they could they they should go there and beat Dewsbury, but Bradford are without Jordan Lilly for the first few months of the season. They might struggle. They might. I could I could very easily see Dex Patton pulling the strings as well. Um, I've always liked Bradford when I've 
caught them mm. on TV over the past couple of years, but their results in the championship have always been sort of up and down um, under John Keir. Um and it'll be hard to say. I think it, well, it, it's you know it'd be a hard one to sort of call. Um, I think because I've this weird advocate for Dewsbury <laughs> because they signed two players. I think one <laughs> player anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, Bradford have weird league form. I think most um, have, have were quite inconsistent recently. Yeah, 100%. so I think this one really is, uh, you know, a flip a coin if you wanted to make a bet for it. Yeah, the next up we've got the newly part-time London Broncos and the Witness Vikings. London Broncos playing their first game at the Cherry Red Record Stadium. Obviously, we know that's Wimbledon AFC's ground. Like they have, they've been rehomed again. Like they do not stop jumping around London. This I think is a totally different topic and a totally different sort of debate to have. But we we I think we both agree they need to find somewhere and stay there. But now that they've gone part time, their squad is nowhere near as good as what it was last season when they should have played better. They didn't play well last season with the squad that they had. But now that they've lost the key members of their squad and they arguably haven't replaced them, they could struggle, couldn't they? Against this witness tonight side. Yeah, they're, yeah. The I mean, the fact that the London Scholars coach became their head coach, and I wouldn't say he did anything particularly special with London Scholars. Um, you know, the fact that they've gone to London Scholars to sign players and things like this, it, it's yeah, it's not looking promising. I will say that the move to the Wimbledon ground isn't something I hate. No, um, I like it, it, and I love the kit as well. I do admit, I do like the kit. Like fair play for them to for putting that kit out as a special sort of Wimbledon thank you. I really like it. Well, it, yeah. I mean, from the ground perspective, it's a four-sided ground. It kind of looks a bit to me. It's like a mini um, Warrington State, Halliwell Jones. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, very similar. But it's, you know, there's no old infrastructure. There's no obstructed views. There's mm. no... And although I think for a, a team in London, 9,000 capacity is not ambitious enough, <laughs> it's still 7,000 more than they normally get through the gates. So... I, you know, it is a positive move, but it's kind of like you've got to now attract a new set of rugby league fans into a different part of London. Um, but yeah, I think this is I think this is an interesting one. Witness have an interest. Uh, Witness have an interesting side, which could be could go anywhere between like a decent side or you know a lower mid table side, um, depending on how they sort of all fit together. But I really, yeah, we really don't like what the Broncos are sort of doing. I know they've sort of been forced into it, but yeah, um, it's quite it's, it's sad to see, isn't it? big game for them to prove that it was sort of the right decision to, to sort of scale back the operation yeah and, and finally wrapping up our, our championship round one fixtures um, we'll go, and we'll go into this a little bit more in our set of six because this is one of the games that we have it's York City Knights versus Featherstone at the Lionel Community Stadium it's Monday night um, should we should we hope that Robin gets himself down there or should we hope that he's in here as, a, as part of our preview call <laughs> I mean yeah, I, I, I can't decide, um, but I, um, I, I, I I feel a lot of pressure having to talk about this game, given that when I need to read through a league, I don't need to read about York. <laughs> I, I, I'm not reading about York, so I'm not sure, but it's two very good squads. Jerry Lillier flew into the UK the other day. If he starts... I'd be, su- game, I'd be surprised if he starts this, this, this first game. If he manages to start or even come off the bench... On the first night of Premier Sports Rugby, who, by the way, they've got an outstanding, um, amount, uh, outstanding. Oh, set yeah, of, it is. It is a. It's arguably a class, class punditry channel, isn't it? They're trying their hardest to to present rugby league. I, it's weird because I think the last time they had rugby league was they had like the NCL on free sports, <laughs> and now they're yeah. going. The, they've shown. The, the rugby league despite that failing despite losing their NRL contract um, and now they've really looked to be pumping um, energy into the championship it's excellent to see um, and this is something where I don't even want to preview this game I just want to say get excited for it get, <laughs> get, you know, get, get paying for a, your fourth sports subscription yeah. the year. If you are if you are a season ticket holder as well, you will get a discount on Premier Sports. So make sure you make the most of that offer. Like go go through your club, make the most of that offer. Get Premier Sports. There's not loads of games on, and we I think we've only got the games for the first half of the season. But you get more than rugby league as well. You get a lot of the American Rugby Union. You get a lot of European football. Like yes, if if you love sport, get Premier Sports. It's not that expensive, and 
if, if you do sports stuff for business, claim it back. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Use it, claim it back, and it's all right. It's not that bad. Speaking of Fev, though, like you said, we mentioned it a little bit earlier. They've signed three, arguably three, two quality players and then one young prop who looks like he could be coming through the system really well. Riley Jacks, the brother of the Toronto failure, Reese Jacks, um, ex-Leeds prop Adam Cuthbertson, and North Devils front rower Ben Matthew all arrive for coach Brian McDermott. Like you said, Joey Leilua arrived in the country, I believe, yesterday or the day before. This Fev team, we we already had it predicted, predicted finishing number one. I think these signings have just put an exclamation point on that, put the cherry on top of the cake. Providing these guys stay injury free, Brian McDermott rotates his squad around, which we know he does very well, brings youth guys in, which we know he does very well as well. Fev are going to blow the league away this year, aren't they? I was today years old when I found out that Adam Cuthbertson was Australian. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> that, that's, um, Robin sat there going, wow, why has Adam Cuthbertson never played for England? What is going on? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so obviously he's bringing back, he's bringing his mate from Leeds in, he's bringing a veteran who he knows exactly what he's going to get out of him. He's probably not going to play him every game because he doesn't need to, he no. won't need to. No, he won't Apparently need to at all. Riley Jacks is a player who I think in the NRL you could see his brain doing the right things, but yeah. his feet were full of following his brain. You know, his brain went faster than his feet, um, and I think you know the slow, probably a little bit of slow down pace in the championship. He could be really good, and like it's not as if he's you know their only halfback option either. No, he's you know, not. They, they've got they don't need to worry about getting him up to speed quickly, um, but they can you know that option is um, is healthy. And again, they've brought in someone to develop from. Mm. I can't pronounce his name. I don't think yeah, but uh, Ben Ben Matthew is is twenty. He's twenty six years old. But the only reason, like you said, he probably hasn't played in the NRL. You mentioned it a little bit earlier. Is the way they do the franchise system, and players don't have that pathway really to get into the NRL. In terms of once the player's there, if they're not quite good enough, they'll get sent away, and then that's something that obviously the NRL maybe need to work on, but. We're coming up to an hour in, and we're coming up to the most important segment of the day. It's another segment where we rely on you and your artistic brain. <laughs> it's time for our badge rating, and this week, it's the Philadelphia fight. So, Philadelphia. let your juices flow, sir. Talk to me. Yeah, so, it's an interesting one. We're going to the North American Rugby League. <laughs> Uh, which interesting competition uh, when you consider that sort of that's how Toronto have decided to keep rugby league alive in in yeah. in Canada and sort of it's passed on to North America. Now orange and greens actually uh, when I was a kid I used to colour in a lot of things in orange <laughs> and green. I used to think it was a really cool colour combination. It works. So I'm already, I'm, yeah, I'm already quite liking that. Um, the the amount the, the writing on the word fight. You know, it's it's very big. You know, the fist is kind of like a WWE set from like 2007 <laughs> or something. Um, Smackdown. That's, S- that's what yeah. it is. It's the Smackdown fist, isn't it? Yeah. So it, it's a bit interesting. I don't. The term fight, it kind of like can't represent fight properly. You know, you can't really. <laughs> it's. I mean, what's their mascot? I hope their mascot isn't a giant fist. Um, but. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, so it leaves me. I think you've got a lot of questions about how you know uh, about how proud they are to actually play in this. But the colours are nice. It's well designed. It's cleanly designed, and there's some interesting tree castle thing on this ring on the finger, which is uh, is actually sort of draws me into the logo uh, and makes me think that there's there's a little bit of story there about about this club. So you know, um, I, I'm gonna rate it. More I'm looking at it, the colour schemes are winning me over, so I'm gonna say it's a it's it's a six. Six um, out of ten. That's the worst one we've had. That is low. I thought it was. I thought this was. I I like this. Like you said, the fight it stands out a little bit, and it's a bit probably a little bit too big. The fist looks a little bit dodgy, like the way it is. It's like it's like his thumb is sort of behind his fingers, and only half of it's popping out. I feel like it should be like directly underneath. It's not quite designed very well. I'm not really sure what's going on at the top there. I think it's meant to be like some sort of flame. But yeah. the, like you said, the colours make everything stand out and that's really good. But no, 6 out of 10, it's lower than I thought. I thought it was going to get at least a 6.5 to a 7. So... Did I create last week? What was the... What was the... Oh, I've, honestly, right off, off the top of my head, 
I can't remember, but it was de- it was I think it was an eight, and it was Castle Con's badge, and I think he rated it an eight because it is oh. it was the yellow and the black one, and I believe it was got an eight. Oh, it's back on one of the old. It's sort of back on last week's script, and I'll I'll look at it and I'll because I need to start making the league table for this as well. Toby's I don't even know what I'm going to call it. Toby's badge rating league table probably something really something yeah, really I'm, boring. <laughs> to have the league table I've now got to start thinking of like you know I can't just have them all at 8 <laughs> yeah you have to compare them all now you have to like yeah. start comparing them to the previous rating of the last one and what you sort of rated that it's the colour scheme is the thing which gives it puts it above a 5 but I'm really just I just think this is a bit of a nasty thing to have on a logo and you know I, I'm kind of grading the team in general calling themselves a fight but I, I'm, I'm not I'm not too for it I'd rather <laughs> Form of animal, or even like the fighting lions, or something. The fighting lions, or something. <laughs> <laughs> I get you. I get you. I get you. Um, you can tell there's only two of us this week because we seem to whip through things a lot quicker, and and that's and that I don't like that. I like it when we sit there and we're deep and we and we get carried away a lot of the time. And I love Robin. I, I've missed Robin's in depth analysis because he does go overboard. But we love it and we appreciate it, and it is sad that he hasn't he isn't here this week, and we and we do miss him. We're gonna keep we're gonna make him feel as guilty as ever. That's why we just keep mentioning his name. Um, but it is time to go to our, our set of six, and we're starting off with the Challenge Cup games, the three the three televised Challenge Cup games, and then one of our standouts. First up, we have the Army versus the Navy. We're gonna have to predict it. We have to predict it. Yeah, I mean, it's impossible for me to predict. Um, I, 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 I couldn't tell you who's better. Um, they both had good wins. Uh, I'm going to go with the Navy purely because the Yorkshire Pros. <laughs> I know someone plays for the Navy. The, the, the Navy, Navy, yeah. Ben Taylor. Uh, ca- like the, the, the Navy captain, for those of you who don't know, is... is uh, ben Taylor, who is the Yorkshire Pros, the guy that we know who does a lot of the poetry about rugby league and Yorkshire and, and everything else, which is quite nice. So you're going for the Navy just because of him. Because of that. And because I think of that. In such a big game like this. So. Yeah, before I do my prediction, um, Robin has texted us his predictions for, for this this um, fixture and the rest of the fixtures. He has gone the army. He's not said why, he's just put army. So that's one to the Navy and one to the army. And this is tough for me because I have the connection with the army from when I lived in Portsmouth and I watched a few games and I covered a few games and I have that connection to the army because I know their media guys and I worked with them last year when they when they came with the women's team to play Bedford Tigers women's in the Super League South. And it's weird. It's like picking between two of your friends having a fight at, at secondary school. Like, you don't care really who wins. You just want it to be a good fight. <laughs> um, we know this is going to be a good game. And I'm struggling to pick a winner. But going off the performances from round one, which it's not a lot. We can't do that. And going off the Navy team that we've seen, and I know more, and I recognise a few more of the Navy, Navy lads. I'm going to have to go with the Navy with this one as well. I have to agree with you with the, with the Navy. I think you don't beat Bridgend 66-0 or 60-0 on a Friday night after a long journey if you're not a quality side. Bridgend will have put up a fight, but the Army will put up a bigger fight, I believe. And the, the travel to Aldershot is not bad from Portsmouth. They're most likely going to be there the night before because it's the way these guys the way these guys prep, the way these guys are, they potentially could go down on Friday. It it's going to be a cracker. Like I said, I'm going to go with the Navy for this one. We, and we, I'm going to have to move on because I'm just not. Otherwise, I'm going to change my mind. Rochdale Hornets versus Midlands Hurricanes, our second televised game of of the weekend. We'll start off with Robin's predictions. He's just gone with Rochdale. He's gone with the home team, and I don't think I can disagree with him really. Yeah, sadly, up the Dale. Um, there is, I don't think there's any good reason to go for Midlands Hurricanes. You know, we wouldn't have expected Coventry Bears to win this game, and they're, they're the same but different. So, 
I can't. I, Rochdale, it'll be. Yeah, I think it's quite an easy one. We're all going to go Rochdale, and I think we're all going to go with with Oldham on the next one. I'm going with Oldham against Lock Lane. Robin's going with Oldham against Lock Lane. Are you going Oldham against Lock Lane? I suppose we have to. Um... You don't have to. You don't have to. You're a point ahead. You are on seven. Wait, I should point out. Toby is on seven and a half points. Me and Robin are now on six and a half points. Toby got all three of his Elite One predictions right last week with one game not being played. So we, we all got a half point for that. If that does happen throughout the season, games are postponed after recording. We will get half points for each of those games. But you are a point ahead, so you can afford to be a little bit risky here. No, I can't, I, I, I can't go against it. I think, you know, we've got our pick for the, the team to... Well, not our pick, but we've got the game which we've talked about, which we think will be close, and I don't think this one will be particularly close. Um, uh, I, I, we've got to go Oldham, um, but again, I know it sounds like we're all trying to predict the same thing, but <laughs> it, it's because it's a TV game, you know. Yeah, we, we won't be able to see our predictions either come to life or fail. And so we're all going to go with Oldham, as we're all going for Rochdale. These, these games are not easy to pick, and I think this next one. Usually would be quite. I would. Have, I think last year or the year before, we would have said it was quite an easy pick, with with the way the scholars were sort of playing and the way Chargers were t- potentially playing. Chargers haven't lost the game, apart from the the Southern Conference League final in over the last twelve months. I'm backing them to beat London Scholars. Robin is backing them to beat London Scholars. Are you backing them to beat London Scholars this week? This is where I guess. To an extent, I'll take my risk, but I think I'll go with I'll, I'll pick with scholars because they should win. Um, and if there is a case that we've all sort of bigged ourselves up and thought with our hearts, I've ended up picking the safe option. You know, <laughs> it's my turn to be to be Robin from last year, always picking the team who should actually win, and not the ones we'd love to see the story of winning. Um, but yeah, so I, I'll pick scholars. If not, to be a little bit different, but also because I think we've just we're just in love with Chargers more than. We probably should be, so yeah. Yeah, and if Eric Sims and Adam Sim and the like can play the way they played against Ellenborough, they'll put up a fight and they'll fight to the very end and they, they would potentially potentially get the win. That's the Challenge Cup games in our prediction done. We move on to game number five. York City Knights versus... This should be game number six. I've done it in the wrong order, so I apologise. York City Knights versus Featherstone Rovers on Monday night. Robin is going against his heart. He's gone with his head on this one. He's gone with he's gone with Fev. Yeah. So with those three news, we, uh, I, when we decided to put Fev top of our table, I was like, oh, I think Lee will win, but as a group, we'll decide Fev. Now, <laughs> Fev made these signings. Their squad is now ridiculously deep, um, and. I think they're I think they're really ready to win the league, and I don't see why this will be a hurdle that they can't they can't jump over on the way to that. Mm. Um, although you know, it's sort of discrediting York because they are a very big hurdle, you know, steeple chase. Um, <laughs> I, I think um, I, th- I think Fev can do it, and I think um, I think this could be the start of a fantastic season for Fev. So I'll pick Fev too. Yeah, it's a three. It's a clean sweep for Fev. We've. They're they're just the best team in the league, aren't they? They have. I know they've not even played a game yet, but they're the best team in the league. They're going to win the championship. I think they're the favourites. They're the odds-on favourites to win the championship at, with most betting companies. Those that are picking Lee, I don't. I just picking Lee because they've been relegated. I don't think anyone other than I think maybe a few non-Fev fans would disagree that Fev are the best team in the comp. So. I think if we were going to put the Lee and versus Fev game in, we might pick we might pick Lee against them. But York are going to really struggle against this top top side. Our next game is a repeat of one of our championship playoff games last year. We have Batley at home against Halifax Panthers, two teams that have bought in players, two teams that look to have improved their squads from last year, two teams that will be looking for playoffs again. I'm picking with my heart, but also with my head. Robin's picking with, I believe, with his head. He doesn't tell me why, but we're both going for facts away over Batley. They they need to start. They started strong last year with a big win over London. Are they going to put a big? Are they going to? Are they going to put Batley to the sword? I know I asked you this earlier, but you've got to give me a, a prediction this time. 
Yeah, I feel like a bit of a hypocrite um, after how you know how I was talking about facts earlier, but I will pick Batley. Um, Ooh, interesting. Yeah, Go ahead. They were fantastic last season. Um, you know, they've got they're at home. Um, you know, it's first game of the season. They're up for it. They're ready, and I think that. You know, I think that it's sort of picking with my heart on well, not my heart, your heart, as I do. With <laughs> He's, you're playing with my heart right now. That's what you're doing. Uh, I'm <laughs> saving the, I'm saving the chance to give your, your, you know, to warm your heart with my picking facts. I'm saving that for when you're in a final or you're in a. <laughs> I'm saving that for when you need the, the moral. <laughs> Thanks. We need to appreciate. I need right it. Now, need it. I'm going to hope that we get, I get, we can get one up on you again by picking Batley, who. <laughs> As I say, I think if they were playing anyone other than Fax Fevel Lee, would we? I'd have to win. Um, so why not pick them to beat Fax and just, especially first game of the season. Yeah, it would be a it definitely put the tail up their backs, wouldn't it? Put the wind up their backs, heading into a into a tough championship season. Arguably, probably the closest championship season we might have for a long time, other than maybe that top two or three sides. So. Fingers crossed for, for everyone. Fingers crossed we have Robin back next week. That is the end of episode three. There may You may see us elsewhere over the course of the next few days. Uh, all, all will be revealed if um, at some point over the next 48 to 72 hours. So um, you may see us elsewhere. If you don't see us elsewhere, we've done something wrong. No, I'm joking. Um... We will, we will let you know sort of anything that's happening um, but half five next Thursday we will be live we, we're not live we will be back we, I'm so used to saying we will be live from last year we'll be back with episode four we'll look at the championship round one we'll look at um, the round two of the challenge cup we'll pick our player of the round it's back to Robin for his for a hall of fame inductee Toby you bring us more NRL watch You'll bring us another badge rating and we'll bring you more of the Biff. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget, drop a like, subscribe to the channel, comment down below if you want us, if there's anyone you think deserves adding into our Hall of Fame. It can be a serious one, it can be a funny one, it can be a moment, a game, a player, it can be whatever you like. And if you're watching on Spotify, please, please share the hell out of this. We are we are trying our best to push for um, over a hundred, just a hundred listeners over both platforms at the minute. We're very much an amateur baby podcast, and we want to we want to push ourselves to the very limits. So share it, listen to it on the way to work, listen to it on the way home, listen to it in the bath, listen to it when you go to bed. I'm not saying that we're boring, but if it makes you go to sleep, put it on. Um, yeah. <laughs> when you it, listen to it again. <laughs> yeah, if you finish, if you if you watch it on YouTube, listen to it again on Spotify. Double up the viewership because tell you what, I'm telling my family to do it. Um, I've been Brad. That's been Toby. That hasn't been Robin tonight. Um, but we'll see you all next week. This been the Biff. Thank you very much. We'll see you all later. <laughs>